Welcome to now living arm anatomy. So we're going to look at three different poses and we're going to draw uh, from the deltoid really to the to the wrist area. So there's no probably better place to start uh, drawing and analyzing the human form uh, than Michelangelo. This is one of the Sistine Chapel Ignudi and uh, we're just going to analyze this wonderful bent arm pose kind of resting on this forearm and upper arm and through here and we'll just indicate the hand uh, as well and I'll do a hand uh, like, uh, video later and get close up to the fingers etc. So getting the now the gesture uh, going here I'll pull out a little bit in a moment you'll see that so you can get a clear view of everything just hang on for a second I realized I was a little bit out of the camera and I corrected that. So just getting the feeling of the gesture coming down from the deltoid to the olecranon, there we go, to now the uh, wrist area and then getting the hand over and through. And so now we can adjust and get all of this wonderful anatomy in. So what we'll do here as we're working is to talk about the anatomy that we're drawing but yet not be so diagrammatic with it. Uh, and be more natural, have a natural kind of sketched uh, finish to it. So bringing down now the volume of the complete forms together, all of the, the deltoid, the biceps, the triceps, the olecranon of the humerus down and, and through. You can already feel where the tricep is going to be attached on both sides. Moving through the deltoid and through here as it overlaps everything ultimately and then comes over to the scapula getting a feel for that scapula coming down that big bulge of the teres major there and minor and working the edge now of the bone and bringing the bicep head over So it's putting all of this information to what it was meant to be used for, to draw better, to draw more accurately. Not to forget gesture and volume, which are more important than anatomy, but to now add the last step to our uh, knowledge and to get even more specific and complete with uh, our drawing training and through here. So an egg form now for the flexors and the extensors. Do you know which side the extensors are on and which side the flexors are on? So you can see clearly the ulna from the olecranon or the elbow coming all the way down to the wrist and the side I'm drawing there are the extensors, right? So grouping them together, that big bulk, bulky Michelangelo-esque egg form. So men and women were drawn muscular. There was little subcutaneous fat over the entire model. Very bulky, very big, and, and most of his models were male. And then they were changed to females, especially for the Sistine Chapel. So getting a sense of where the olecranon comes in, the uh, condyles of the lateral and medial, and you can feel where the humerus bulge would come through here and then meet the acromion process of the scapula up there. Now feeling the ulna, see how the ulna at the top attaches to the olecranon through ligament but also has that mouth shape. And so we're seeing the back part of the ulna and then the styloid process down below. That bulkier ulna, what I call the ulna P or the ulna protrusion down below. Attaching on the muscle forms back through, and then the oh, the wrist wants to move in this direction as a block. That line is very important. All that's cylindrical, and ending the extensor forms, and then down below is more bulgy ligament uh, uh, tendon material and then I'm moving the arm over a little bit. I give it more of a, uh, a an angle which is okay. And then the flexors extending and then moving downward and then even below the the forearm is so uh, developed that even the lower part of the forearm has a bulge to it. And then getting the feel of where the sacrospinalis is over there, the pectoral here 
getting a gesture as it moves back up and in, the lats are over there, and then we're going to get a little bit of the rectus abdominis further and moving over, and of course uh, that will start to crash and bulge into one another and come down to the end of the rectus abdominis. Now at the top here, feeling the scapula now, the chromium process, the spine of it, and then the trapezius above it, up in through there, and then of course now we're at the acromion process of the scapula covered by material and skin and through and you can see that bulge with the humeral humerus ball is underneath that but we start to get around this as it's contracted up and through all that's in contraction and then down the deltoid the lateral edge of that and over as it crashes down So the idea here is to find a little, I'm going to draw a little bit more of the deltoid than what Michelangelo is showing just to show the overlap to you see that. But some, you know, a lot of times you won't be able to tell as much where the deltoid ends and where the triceps and the biceps begin. So you've got to know it. You've got to have trained, done your diagrams and all the other work. And then as you start to sketch from reality, live, master studies, etc., you have a better, much greater understanding of where all that is. So that a natural kind of occurring stylistic uh, interpretation of the figure can occur. If you take a look at Michelangelo's painting, the fresco next to us here, it, it's very stylized and simplified, quite, quite a bit simplified. But we immediately know the style Michelangelo. Bulky figures, I would not call him a colorist, it's a very simple palette for the most part, even though the color can be bright once they cleaned it. Now getting back to the anatomy, the triceps bulging coming out and underneath and over the head, the medial, the longer head, right, will be in here and it has a cupping kind of feeling as that larger tendon will, will attach all the way down to the olecranon on top of the ulna. So it has a bowl kind of shape as I'm demonstrating here and then the two long tendons of each head will come down to the outer edge of each condyle. So the axis of thickness of the entire bulky area of the bicep and the tricep is where I indicated that line. I need to do a video on axis and width. It's not necessarily an anatomy thing. This is more of a figure thing. Bulkier head of the bicep now he, 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 it flattens and then it gets bulgy and then it flattens again and then it comes all the way down as it attaches now to the ulna, this particular head. We'll get that in a moment. So this line right there gets comes in and it gets a little straighter right in through there. And then we meet overlapping will be the brachioradialis and extensor carpi radialis longus. So we're already getting a nice shape to that already. Michelangelo makes it easy for us. And look how bulky the forearm is. It's really bulky. Here's the axis, the thickness, the greatest thickness across the form is the axis of width. So I'll go in here and separate a little bit where that tendon of the tricep attaches onto the lateral epicondyle here, you can it's clear as day, right, in through there. Then we get the top part of the ulna and then the bottom part of the humerus, the olecranon area. Right in through there, he makes it pretty clear. So we can be clear with our study of anatomy through Michelangelo's vision, which is a totally acceptable way of analyzing studying. As a matter of fact, that's how he studied and, and learned in generations after him. So the head of the tricep and then the tendon coming down and are coming up, if you will, and then the head, the medial head over, and we'll just make that a rounded ball head. You won't see the, the, the complete medial, the third head of the trice, uh, tricep in this, in this view. As a matter of fact, you rarely see it. It's underneath the other two. Working the electron on here. 
hand over, hand over. Tendon head of the lateral tricep in through here, and you can use the shading in this case, especially to help see the form in its roundness and, and its location as well. And so that bulking head where that core shadow is, where that head bulks, gives us a sense of that form's direction, just like I'm showing there. Normally I would go ahead and tone it down quickly, but a little bit different purpose here. The end of the, the head of the tricep here, and then it comes down nicely into the tendon all the way down to the lateral epicondyle here and then over and attaches in through there. And then the space between, remember it's kind of like the gastrocnemius, but that space between is upon neuroses tendon, the back of the underneath part of your tricep. And it's not very bulky back there, but it's tendinous, tough, fibrous, elastic material. Now getting up here, feeling the acromion process in the scapula coming together and the humeral ball underneath slightly. A little bulge right in through here, the teres minor coming over, bulky. All right, we feel that through in through here in this crease now, the deltoid coming over. Okay, and then we'll feel the scapula now even further. You can see that it's triangular feeling trapezius up here and it'll, it'll get us off the paper. The scapula now more triangular, more greater than 90 degrees at its turn here just slightly in downward. You can see it fits into these feeling of the back and over and downward very softly gently but there it is for you. It comes about halfway down the, the rib cage and back and through. Now we're at the Teres major and minor areas, and the teres major is just glaring at us. It's just it's it's so obvious that big saucy circular round round form right in through. Let's see if I go underneath. There it is, and right. Come on, keep going, Mark. There it is. There's your teres major attached to the medial side of the scapula. And there it is for for sure. Really nice and, and bulky right in through there. And then there's that indentation, that fossa, where the infraspinatus sits right above it, where there's a little shadow in through there. And that all has plays a part in the deltoid as well. We really get most more of that into the back, but you can see what's going on there. And it's a greatly more much more simplified painting than his drawings would get very super detailed. It seems like his drawings, like everything was almost flexed. It was so intense. There was just no fat on the model at all. Coming down to the end of the erector spinae muscles, do you remember those? The spinalis, the longissimus, and the iliocostalis muscle. In through there's attaches at the base of the pelvis. So just getting a feeling of the back, but that's enough for that. So we want to make sure that we're back to the upper arm. But it's good to put on some of the other areas so that we can give a geographic location of what we have together here. So deltoid head moving over and that's now you can get the feeling of the form through the shadow pattern so I'm just feeling out the shadow and I'll tone that down a little bit I try not to get well there I go now I try not to go too crazy with shadow we'll get into a lecture on light value edges and contrasts so that tells you how the deltoid is turning but that line I make over the tricep right through there that's where that and that's stronger than what Michelangelo has I know that and I'm just trying to point out there how the deltoid overlaps in anatomy he doesn't show it there to gracefully show smoothness and elegance he did that for a reason Michelangelo was a master at anatomy he he dissected cadavers and he could get a hold of them and, and really under, understand what made our world, what made the human form, give us the surface quality that it, that it does. And here we are today learning from that. Whether you want to be more traditional or, like me, more postmodern with your art, these techniques. If you've been studying the human figure for 
for learning to draw better. That's, that's great. You have no interest in making art that's figurative. It's still a worthwhile pursuit. So now carving out the olecranon, we can see the ulna really standing out. It's almost screaming out at us. Uh, and I make mine a little bit more angled um, just for flow. And I was really concerned to make sure I get it in the page. So you have full rights to change the pose a little bit. If you if you can, you want. Now here's the side of the, the ulna, the thickness of the ulna, where you can see that shadow is. And some you're getting some extensors. The uh, extensor carpi ulnaris would be in that range attached to it. But I give it some contour there with the shadow and the toning. But it's also the side of the bone. It's like a block. Do you see that? The shadow side is the left side going back away from us. And then the lit, lit side is um, kind of showing out in front of us. So there you go. It's a better view of the volumetric quality of what's going on with that bone. But the bone stands out clearly, clearly. It runs, you can see it run all the way down to the styloid process. And then we have the a little bit now of the extensors coming out and the brachy, brachioradialis moving outward, which attaches up to the humerus. And the extensor carpi radialis longus. They really bulk out. I love Michelangelo's forearm studies. He really puts them very bulky so we can see that anatomy cleanly and clearly. I think it's kind of fun to narrate these drawings after I did them. I just didn't have any... I thought it would be nice to like just draw so they could actually could go faster and not talk while I draw for a change. Brachial radialis, then it then it flattens. See how it flattens out there? Then it comes back over a little bit. And then we get the extensor carpi radialis longus and then over to the extensor carpi ulnaris area. And he's simplifying that. They don't striate, they don't stand out in this particular pose. Sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. What's important is to group them together. Know which side you're on. Am I on the extensor side or am I on the flexor side? If you forget, if you don't go back and look at your drawings in your notes or go back and look look at the anatomy section uh, that I've done here so that to help. Now we'll come over to get the flexors. Very pronounced flexors in through here. Ulnaris, flexor carpi ulnaris, and then probably even the, not quite the palmaris, but almost, almost in through there. There's some deeper, deeper muscles that we don't need to, to name. But again, the whole form to start out with was when the egg form in a tube, and then you get to the specifics of the muscle contouring. And then here he gives a little bulky egg uh, shadowing just slightly. Let's go back to the extensor side here. I separate a little bit, a little strong divot right in through there. You can, you can see where he makes the light show there. Turning over. The flexor. And it's a little more bulky as it continues to come down and it starts to straighten out just a little. And this is another sub egg form. The end of the form where it starts to become tendons is so developed that the tendon area is larger and wider. And there's your axis in through there. So we get the straightness here, and then we get another curve. Do you see that curving down? And then on through. So this is a contouring, but we want to see it in conjunction to the volumetric context. So the whole grouping of what? We have extensors to the left. We have the ulna in the middle. And then we have the flexors on the right. And they all make a tube and then they make egg forms in the tube. And then we can separate them into more distinctive muscle groups if we need to, if they show. Otherwise, your finished drawings, if you're drawing for a natural look, will begin to look like uh, anatomical studies. So anatomy can be subsumed and it can be controlled 
and pushed back when we want. Otherwise, we're going to start to draw draw like uh, Paula Yulo. If you haven't, if you don't know his, he's an early Renaissance Italian artist, beautiful draftsman, infatuated by anatomy, and every figure he drew was as if every piece of anatomy was flexed and and moving. We just can't have that. Some muscles have to be relaxed while others are more contracted. Squared off wrist area, the ulna styloid process coming out. The hypothenar muscles make a block in through there. So we're almost got everything we need. Now we can just kind of clean up a little bit. Bring this out, the flexors a little bit further. Well, I won't go into a full value finish. Because it's not important, but we want to be clear with our diagramming or rendering. You can do studies for value. You can do studies for anatomy, which we're doing, and form, which we're doing. You can do studies for gesture. You can do studies for color. There are many different ways to, excuse me, study the model, study the uh, art historical information given by, uh, in this case, Michelangelo, the masters. So there are many different ways to study it, and they all come together in the end. And you learn it so well, you don't really think about it while you're doing it. You just you just draw or you paint, and that's what you want to get to. However long that takes, if it takes five years, ten years, it generally took an apprentice, um, a student, even the geniuses, Raphael, Leonardo. Michelangelo, 10 years, 11 years in, in a guild to come out and train. From 10 years old, they would start at 10, 11, 12 maybe, but that, that early until they, they got their apprenticeship finished and they were a master apprentice or journeyman. And then they moved, moved on. You know, you look at Bernini. My wife was looking at Bernini the other day, and it, it was... Uh, Michelangelo, uh, excuse me, Bernini's David, which is one of my probably my favorite David, and he finished. He made that at 25, and my wife was amazed. And I said, "That's about right for the training that they got." One thing is, they trained early, they trained deeply, but they were very limited into what art was. We go through many different variations now in training because there's so many more art movements to work through. So it's much more difficult to be an art student today than it was in the, the 16th or even the, yeah, the 16th century, maybe the late four, uh, 15th as well. Little flexor, carpi ulnaris coming out, separating it from the, here from the brachioradialis. I mean, we could go deeply into this. We could take quite a bit of time here, but I'm just getting a little bit more separation with a finer pencil using a Conte crayon, a thicker crayon. If you're not comfortable with that, draw what in whatever you're comfortable with. These are just, it's nice to draw, be able to draw bigger so the camera can pick, pick it up a little bit better, that's why. When I draw small, I use a fountain pen. When I draw medium, I use charcoal or I'll use graphite or I'll use uh, uh, polychromous waxy kind of pencils either way. Any of it's fine. Get used to using all of it if you can. Draw small, draw big. Here I'm separating the Flexor carpi ulnaris from the bone, as Michelangelo has showed us to do, as he did these studies from observation. And just getting a little contouring around and through and working the tendon down. So we're pretty, pretty much there. I'll take a little darker area and just indicate the tendon across the bone there, the brachioradialis that it overlaps the bicep there. And just filling in these really strong little spots of the head now, excuse me, of the tendon of the lateral tricep, tricep head moving. And we could contour out this all day, just a few more, a few more minutes here. We'll go on to the next little turn of the tricep in through there. And we'll tone this back 
so you can see this a little further. This is not quite as round, it's a little bit more oval shaped. That acromion process through here, a little bit more oval. Right in through there. There's a little overlap too at the top of the acromion process on the left side. I hope I get that. If not, that's okay. Sometimes you do a drawing and then you 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 step back and you look at it, you know, a day or two. You're like, oops, I need to define that area. That's very common. Back through the trapezius and over downward as it cascades into the spinal area and through there. Just feeling these, teasing these out a little bit further. Michelangelo gives us just enough to subdue that and through here and around, a turning around and through. Core shadow a little bit stronger here. And I think that's enough.